already on adult smile deformity and treatment of deformity. So some of those principles will be uh, reiterated in this talk. So in this talk, we're going to talk a little bit about how to decide between massive versus selective approach uh, for multi-level degenerative uh, lumbar disease, particularly uh, degenerative scoliosis. Here are my disclosures. Uh, there should be no direct conflict with the talk. So adult spinal deformity is a very prevalent problem. In the United States, we, we um, estimate that this is, uh, th the range has been reported anywhere from 2.5 to 25 percent, but the average is somewhere between 6 to 8 percent. Most of these are de novo adult degenerative uh, spinal uh, scoliosis, as you've heard, and this is uh, mostly from uh, degeneration of facet as well as dysphasis. Unlike our pediatric patients, uh, the predominant clinical symptom is really pain. Uh, the pain could be back pain at the apex, uh, pain from sagittal or coronal imbalance that's typically worse with standing, or pain that's uh, uh, neurogenic or uh, ridiculous in origin. And these pain obviously can come in combination. Uh, rarely do we see uh, uh, progressive deforming in these adults uh, for, in most cases. So, you know, predominantly what we're trying to address is the pain. So to relate pain and spine surgery, we know that, you know, we generally do very well in relieving radicular pain or neurogenic claudication from stenosis and compression. Axial back pains are also very uh, effective when we identify areas of deformity and, and instability. Um, and we've also learned in the uh, degenerative uh, scoliosis and all spinal deformity work that restoring sagittal and coronal imbalance significantly improves patient's outcome in terms of pain relief. Uh, we'll go through this, uh, skip this slide real quickly. We've seen the principle these have done mostly by Glassman's uh, et al. study as well as uh, Schwab's study where you have a series of radiographic parameter that, that correlates with uh, optimal outcome for spinal deformity surgery. Uh, restoring SVA and making sure the spinal pelvic uh, alignment is well aligned as well as restoring coronal uh, uh, balance. So if you look at the classic uh, principal teachings for adult deformity, uh, this was discussed earlier. You want to fuse from M vertebrae to M vertebrae, treating all the cob angles. Uh, you also want to avoid stopping in the middle of the curve, in the apex of the curve, stopping in neutral. So you want to stop at the neutral or stable vertebrae. And obviously, uh, for deformity, you want to think about how to restore uh, alignment, and some of these may require osteotomy. Ultimately, what this all means is that, you know, if you use uh, the classic approach as a a hammer and nail approach, all these cases are going to be treated long segment uh, thoracolumbar fusions. So these long thoracolumbar fusions do lead to great outcomes. However, we're often humbled by our complications. If you look at the complication rate, uh, uh, meta-analysis and systematic review will tell you that this is about, these type of surgery are about, associated with about 50% complication rate. You know, I always quote this study uh, from Mike Dobbs uh, and, and the Linky Group, and if you see that this is, you know, uh, one of the premier centers in treating deformity, that their complication profile was about 40% uh, with 20% major morbidity, 10-hour oper operating time, estimated blood loss of 2 liters, with a revision rate of about a third of the cases by 5 years. So these are pretty daunting numbers, and, and while the outcomes are quite favorable in these uh, treatments. Uh, these complications certainly humble us when we see them uh, in our post-operative care or in our clinical practice follow-up. So when we look at factors uh, for complication in these uh, long segment cases, uh, age of the patient clearly matters. Older patients have more uh, medical comorbidities. Uh, blood loss uh, has been uh, shown to be an independent variable associated with higher complication rates. And then certainly what we do as surgeon, the surgical invasiveness, the type of surgery we prescribe has a big impact on the uh, potential for complication. So we probably can't change the age of the patient, but we can certainly change the uh, complexity of the surgery and the surgical invasiveness ultimately uh, hoping to lead, uh, lead to lesser blood loss and decrease our overall morbidity rate. So when I think about these uh, adult uh, spinal deforming cases or multi low degenerate uh, cases, and I think one of the things I try to decide is what's the uh, minimal uh, amount of surgery I need to achieve uh, optimal uh, symptomatic relief. So uh, we try to identify the pain generators, and again, uh, we don't have all the answers, but favorable cl clinical uh, indicator for a more selective approach is when we have uh, isolated radicular pain symptom. It's not uncommon for these patients to have classic L4, L5 radicular pain symptom from a lumbar sacral junctional uh, problem at the fractional curve. 
uh, patients who have neurogenic claudication with uh, a, a short segment stenosis also are very favorable uh, patients that can be treated with more selective uh, type of indications. Uh, spondylolisthesis, spondylolisthesis that uh, have instability as well as stenosis, when they, especially if they are treated uh, with injections where you both have uh, the uh, therapeutic as well as a diagnostic effect can lead to uh, a, a better uh, post-surgical outcome. And certainly patients with a global uh, balanced spine are favorable for a more selective approach. Uh, there are indicators that are unfavorable for a more selective approach. Patients who have predominant axial back pain are certainly uh, a, pro a potential problem because, as we know, axial back pain uh, is, not is a difficult uh, diagnostic dilemma for us as spine surgeons. Uh, pain at the apex of the curve uh, generally means that you've got to treat the curve, uh, and there's also the risk of deformity uh, progression in these cases. Uh, patients who have generalized uh, back pain from sagittal chronic imbalance with truncal shifts are uh, much more uh, difficult to treat with selective approach. So this is a, uh, a study that was published uh, from China just within the last couple of years, and they uh, looked at their experience with the uh, a more selective approach for treating degenerative scoliosis. And they looked at about 46 patients, and their uh, treatment technique was selective uh, uh, segmental T lift. And you can see that majority of the cases are one or two level T lifts. And they were able to get a fairly nice Cobb angle correction of the curve from about 31 degrees down to about 14 degrees. Uh, in each of the segments where they did T lifts, they increased the lordosis by five degrees uh, per segment. Now, in their clinical outcome reports, these patients did uh, very well from, a, uh, from an outcome standpoint. However, the, uh, the, uh, the downside of this paper is that they did not address what were the sagittal and the coronal profile for these patients before and after surgery. So taking into that account, um, the, uh, the ISSG had a uh, mid-invasive uh, focus group, and they developed this classification that sort of helps us uh, to mainly to determine when, when is a good time, uh, when are the, uh, where, where is the ideal case for a mid-invasive approach for adult smile deformity. And they break, the, they break the adult smile deformity into three classes. Class ones are really your, uh, your balanced uh, spine patients where they have a relatively low SVA, uh, they have uh, low uh, pelvic tilt, and they have no significant mismatch between lumbar lordosis and pelvic incidence. Class two are basically your compensated uh, sagittal uh, balance patients where they have, they're still within the six uh, centimeter of uh, sa uh, sagittal vertical axis. However, they have a bigger Cobb angle and they have a bit of a lumbar lordosis mismatch. In the, in the first cl class, you don't have to do anything other than try to improve their lordosis or improve the sagittal profile uh, minimally, if any. But in class two, you have to start thinking about how you're going to maximize their lordosis with your sagittal correction. Class three are really your decompensated sagittal imbalance patients where they have stiff curves and they're out of alignment. And these generally require more long segment uh, and the bigger operation. So I'll talk a little bit about mid-invasive spine surgery. We know mid-invasive spine surgery has really uh, been around for about 20 years. Uh, it's really based on the philosophy to minimize uh, soft tissue damage and collateral damage, still, but still achieving the decompression and stabilization we need for most spine surgery. I think the things that have changed over the last uh, uh, decade is really uh, what Jeff talked about, the uh, ability to correct a lot of your deformity, do these lateral and anterior axis approaches, do a mid-invasive form. Uh, and also the long segment percutaneous instrumentation uh, that can span essentially the alto thoracal lumbar spine. Uh, so, you know, I sort of look at mid invasive versus open surgery in this fashion. Open surgery is like flying a plane in an open cockpit where you can see directly where you're going, you can feel the wind if the wind's blowing too hard, ultimately, you're flying a plane. Mid invasive approach is taking a different approach. You're looking at a map from a, a GPS guided map or navigation. Uh, you're contr you don't necessarily feel the elements around you. On the other hand, the end result is the same. You still got to fly the plane, get, uh, get, uh, get the planes landed safely. So from a uh, mid-invasive approach standpoint, uh, posterior lateral is really the sort of the workforce for most of our degenerate uh, spine diseases for uh, decompression and fusion. MIST lift, uh, is a common uh, way that we use to treat these, uh, uh, to treat the more uh, selected, limited approaches, uh, particularly placing the cages on the uh, concave side. And nowadays, with the percutaneous instrumentation, the reduction techniques are quite powerful to allow us to address some of the deformity that we couldn't do previously. 
Uh, I think the game changer is really these ladder approaches. This is uh, a ladder, the ladder approach is a minimum access approach that really could span pretty much throughout the lumbar spine now that we can do OLIV. Uh, you generally don't need an access surgeon unless you're addressing the L5-S1. And th this, uh, the uh, anterior uh, lateral approach really gives you a nice release to get a nice in-plate coverage in order to get not only um, uh, deformity correction as well as a, a solid fusion platform. I think that one of the reasons why these uh, procedures have really uh, uh, been, uh, become very popular is because the learning curves for this procedure for the uh, typical uh, average uh, spine surgeon is very favorable. Unlike the laparoscopic, the thoracoscopic approaches we saw in the early 90s, uh, these uh, approaches have fallen out of favor because the learning curves were just too extreme for those cases. So I'm going to finish uh, my talk just giving you some case example on the, the uh, various uh, uh, cases uh, dealing with the, uh, the, the MIS uh, deformity algorithm uh, classification. Uh, case one is sort of your classic uh, type one uh, uh, case. It's an 80-year-old uh, retired uh, physician who basically present with back and leg pain for several years. And the neurogenic claudication was really his predominant symptom. You can see that the four, he's got degenerative disease throughout up and down the entire spine. So if this was axial back pain, it'd be a little difficult to figure out where his pain generated is. But he had an isolated uh, area of severe stenosis at L4-5. Uh, this is his uh, films. You can see he's got a pretty favorable uh, sagittal balance, uh, pelvic till, and he was well within the uh, lumbar lordosis to pelvic uh, instant uh, match with a very uh, mild to moderate uh, cob angle. So this is, you know, this was treated just with an invasive uh, tubular approach, uh, MIST lift, uh, which we addressed decompression in the same setting, and he's actually done uh, very well. You can, uh, we I actually, he was doing so well, I actually did not even get a chance to uh, get his scully films after the surgery, uh, but he's, we didn't do anything to his curve. We mainly treated his neurogenic claudication, and, and he remains uh, balanced after the procedure. Class two, uh, case two is more of an example of a class two type of procedure, a 73-year-old gentleman who was referred to me by a cardiologist, so obviously not the uh, most healthiest patient. He's been debilitated by back and leg pain for the past uh, basically several years and has exhausted all his conservative treatment options without improvement. Uh, this is his uh, film. You can see he's got mild degenerative uh, scoliosis with a... Uh, a, a compensated sagittal balance, and his SV is actually uh, slightly more positive than we would like for a class two. Um, CT myelogram shows uh, stenosis uh, at uh, several levels in his uh, lumbar spine with vacuum disappearance, pretty much through his lumbar spine. So we basically did uh, tackle this uh, using a stage approach. We uh, uh, will do a lateral approach using uh, the, the uh, techniques that. Uh, Jeff uh, described earlier uh, from L2 to S1 and then we actually get an MRI in a lot of these cases to see how much indirect decompression we get before we decide where the decompression needs to take place by direct decompression. Uh, in the stage two because we had a fairly good decompression and his symptoms were actually uh, resolved from his uh, neurogenic claudication and radicular pain symptoms we did a very limited uh, decompression basically did a percutaneous uh, instrumentation to stabilize him and you can see you get a nice uh, both sagittal and coronal correction just do these minimum approaches and this is his film afterwards finally uh, class 3 is uh, is this type uh, case 3 is a type uh, 3 uh, classification this is your uh, your case of uh, both sagittal and coronal imbalance, you had a uh, high grade SVA uh, as well as Cobb angle and a, a very mismatched uh, lumbar lordosis to pelvic incident. Um, and this lady actually had uh, lumbar laminectomy as his initial treatment because she, was, she was the wife of a physician who wanted to have the smallest, amount, uh, smallest possible surgery to treat her, her back and leg pain symptoms initially and actually failed uh, the laminectomy. And ultimately, uh, we did uh, this do a, a uh, anterior posterior approach with uh, A-lift at 4551 followed by T10 to pelvis uh, uh, instrument infusion with uh, Smith-Peterson osteotomy. So in summary, uh, you know, treatment of degenerative uh, scoliosis uh, 
uh, traditionally often requires long segment fusion, but I do think we could be selective. Uh, we're treating patients with radiculopathy and neurogenic collocation who have balanced spine in a more selective way. This can mean more segment, short segment fusion or a more minimal approach. And uh, patients, uh, unfortunately, with uh, significant stature and coronal imbalance, as shown in some of the previous talk, are still best treated with long segment uh, thoracolumbar fusion with osteotomy in some of those cases. Thank you.